essentially comment on the book that we have uh, just published and launched, Memories Archived, Contemporary Views from South Asia. We have uh, Susanna Bastos Mateus, who we've worked with, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with over this last year and a half. Uh, Susanna is a researcher at the Alberto Benveniste Chair of Sephardic Studies at the University of Lisbon. She is a member of the International Research Group, History of the Inquisitions, and of the editorial board of the journal Cadernos de Estudos Sepharditas. She is co-author of the trial of Catarina de Orta by the Goa Inquisition with Miguel Rodriguez, Lorenzo, and Carla Vieira. Presently, she is coordinating the project Praying to the God of Israel, according to the Portuguese tradition, 16th to 18th centuries, which is dedicated to studying the circulation of clandestine prayer books in the Iberian world during the early modern period. Her principal research field focuses on the dynamics of the Sephardic diaspora of the 16th century, studying the role of women and questioning the importance of gender as an element of resistance and agency. Fernando Velho is an architect with degrees from the Goa College of Architecture and the University of Michigan. Over the years, he has collaborated with design practices from across Asia, North America, and Europe. While working with WOW Architects in Singapore in 2013, the Singapore Institute of Architects awarded one of his projects, the Zero Waste Archifest Pavilion, its Design and Excellence Award. He has also collaborated with Ayaz Basrai and Mansi Badwe to design the India Pavilion at the Dubai Design Week in 2019. Fernando Velho is currently based in Goa with a practice dedicated to architecture, furniture design, heritage conservation, and research. He also teaches at SEPT and the Goa College of Architecture. Kaustub Naik is a scholar and a writer based between Goa and Philadelphia. He has previously studied at the Ambedkar University, Delhi, and the School of Arts and Aesthetics in JNU. He is also a playwright and theater maker, and his plays have performed in venues across India and abroad. He recently collaborated on a musical theater project with novelist Amitav Ghosh and singer Ali Sethi on a graphic novel by Salman Tour, which opened in Philadelphia. He has been awarded the D.D. Kosambi Fellowship by the government of Goa and the Tendulkar Dubey Fellowship awarded to young promising theater makers. He is currently a doctoral candidate in South Asia Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, working on his PhD thesis on Goan history. I invite uh, Fernando Velho uh, to the dice. In my uh, response uh, to the reading of uh, the project Memory Archive by uh, Dale Luis Menezes, uh, Leandre de Souza, and Susana Bastos Mateos, uh, I would like to uh, begin with uh, the saying of uh, the late American theorist Susan Sontag. So uh, Susan Sontag argues, uh, she argues that photography gives people an imaginary possession of the past that is unreal. She also further goes to say that uh, it's a kind of short step from uh, self-expression and recording to the outright ownership of a subject. So uh, to kind of unpack this, I would like to uh, recount a personal uh, anecdote of mine. Uh, I am a great fan of visiting museums, and uh, uh, there was a time where I used to visit uh, museums in the US where I was studying, and there were these whole collections of African masks that were on display all across these museums, because there was this fascination uh, of displaying these masks completely removed from their cultural context in the museums. And I got to know that these masks reach these museums uh, through US aid workers. The very simple act of going as a student, volunteering in Africa, collecting these masks and returning uh, to the US, purchasing these masks legally. And then uh, these form parts of large collections that become an African mask collection by which then they are institutionalized, studied, and the culture of Africa 
is somehow unpacked from a single object. That's the mask. And then this becomes so pervasive uh, that this very act of collecting and classifying uh, then begins uh, identifying African culture uh, as a point of reference to the mainstream museum goer. As a kind of singular culture of a diverse continent is, unfo is unpacked as something being African. And Africa, as we know it, is not a country. It's a diverse continent with many, many cultures. But this act of, this innocent act of collecting these objects and classifying them has led to the marginalization of the people who produce these objects. And this is the power of the archive. Uh, an African artist does not have uh, the same power to do this, say, to the Mona Lisa. You cannot approach an object like the Mona Lisa with that same level of ignorance, because uh, this object has been written over, contested, uh, its history is so well documented. But this is typically uh, where the archive is a repository of power. And within that, uh, that power needs to be contested. And this is uh, one of the reasons I was so taken up by this project. And uh, because Goa has some of the oldest archival material uh, that exists in Goa, uh, that exists in Asia, and this gives researchers uh, and local Goans an ability to go and contest the way in which their histories have been told, and every generation a new bunch of scholars can go and unpack the archive and tell new stories, but also kind of uh, bring out the voices of the marginalized and uh, so this project then gives uh, set in Goa is something I think of utmost importance because uh, the, I could uh, uh, I could extrapolate this on something I see uh, happening quite often. Uh, while uh, I bring out this uh, I bring out the subject of the African mask uh, because it's so uh, it's so culturally pervasive. You see movies like The Mask in which Jim Carrey kind of puts on a mask and he acquires new powers. But it also kind of brings out an orientalized version of what uh, African culture is. But now this is also uh, happening at the national level in India. All across uh, Goa, you're seeing objects uh, similarly. Uh, that are being appropriated from marginalized communities and being reproduced uh, and commodified by dominant sections of the society in the name of revival, the same act of dispossession that we saw uh, of these masks in Africa, we are seeing it in Goa. And uh, I can easily point out uh, a good example, uh, that being the revival of the Kunbi Sare. It's, I always like read these uh, curators writing about the Kunbi Sare without the uh, people who produce the Kunbi Sare being forefronted. And this is an act of dispossession, but uh, this is at the level of uh, the Kunbi Sare. But, uh, as we reproduce images of Goa, I see the same uh, tendency happening in the form of photography. And photography is an industrial art. Uh, it can be reproduced, uh, the object, the photograph can be uh, reproduced in its millions and uh, circulated. Uh, and frequently, the photos taken of Goa are bereft of uh, the local resident. Uh, they are these images of extreme beauty or of great architecture, but they do not have the people who produce these histories. And this is where I think a project like this that looks back into the archive and uh, looks at the objects and tries to understand that even if there aren't histories written about the Kunbi Sare, 
uh, what is this act of uh, taking over someone else's history, reappropriating it, and telling it in your uh, in your narrative? What does that do to the people who produce these objects? Is it an act of uh, revival, or is it an act of appropriation? And this is where I think uh, a project like this, uh, which brings together artists, had that question the very basis of uh, classification and the archive, will create narratives uh, that are different uh, from what are being created, but will also challenge uh, dominant, uh, nar dominant narratives of Goa. Uh, okay, so I uh, would like to also uh, see this book uh, take a very different, uh, so, sorry, take a life in which it sets a trend for future artists to question the role of the archive in the same way uh, there are many stories in Goa that are not recorded but they are not recorded formally in the archive, uh, but they are recorded in uh, forms of folklore, uh, storytelling, drama, song, uh, etc. So uh, one cannot approach the archive only as a formal written uh, archive, uh, but uh, the Goan story has to be told by engaging with a diverse set of uh, diverse set of narratives that exist outside the archive. And uh, in order to, uh, in order to, not repeat the mistakes of the past, uh, the archive has to be constantly referred to, contested. New narratives have to be brought forward, but also whose stories are we telling? What are we appropriating? And uh, how do we want to tell these stories? Becomes all the more important when. Uh, independence movements become a uh, rule. And uh, this is uh, the stories of feminism, uh, the stories of queerness, etc., have to be brought out. And a new way of looking at the archive is, uh, and broadening the scope of the archive is what I hope uh, this book uh, will inspire other artists to do. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Fernando. I now invite Kaustu to say a few words. Good evening, everybody. Uh, there's just a mistake on the post. I'm not a doctor yet. Uh, yeah. At the outset, let me thank uh, Suna Pranta and Fundasa Orient for in inviting me to respond to this wonderful mediation on archival exploration through art and also congratulate them, Leandra, Susanna, and Dale, and all the artists who have worked towards putting together this great exhibition. As a historian working on Goa and also dabbling into the arts, I am thrilled to see such critical engagement with archival material and the outcomes that are exhibited as a part of this exhibition. Susanna's invocation of Kipu, a fascinating example of indigenous memory keeping, reminded me of something similar from a very different time period and how remembering is synonymous with tying a knot. In Urdu, the word, word gaat banna or giro banna is literally meaning tying of knot, refers to remembering. It is said, it's popularly believed that uh, the famous 19th century Urdu poet Mirza Ghalib would sit in front of a flame in an inebriated state during the night, trying to come up with couplets. Once he was satisfied, he would tie a knot on his fingers. He would only undo each knot in the morning as if finished putting these couplets on the paper. And you know, that's something that we have memory as a knot tying, as a tradition continues way into 19th century. Um, more so, I mean, we were asked to respond and come up with few questions uh, in response to the book. So I came with two broader questions and it has a lot of nested questions in it. And I, I won't take much time in just two paragraphs. Um, historians were singularly expected to maintain fidelity with the archive and not question it, its veracity, like conventionally. 
But as historiographical trends have changed, people started asking all sorts of questions of the archives to compensate for obvious silences and absences that archives hinted at. This exercise has over the years achieved a lot of traction to an extent that archives are mined now uh, in order to restore agency of the marginalized, uh, marginalized peripheral lives and discourses. While its intent is rightly justified, I want to pause and ask the panel today, what are the ethical dimensions of such recovery? I mean, just in resonance with what uh, Fernando was saying uh, just now. For instance, the recovering of the voice of the colonized subaltern uh, as a passive recipient of, of the colonization process in somehow reaffirms the colonizer-colonized binary. And I'm given to understand that the process of producing this exhibition has gone beyond working towards these kind of binaries. In which case, what happens to something like caste in South Asia or any other forms of hegemonic power structures that operate parallel and or in conjunction to colonialism? So this is like the first question. And secondly, I was quite intrigued by the phrase that Leandre used that called archives are performed. Performance by nature eludes archival capture. And there are all sorts of questions that can be asked around it. The first being um, something that Leanne recited from Nishant's interview was that, uh, as Nishant put it in his piece, the institu institutionalizing aspect of archives impose limits on it. So alternatively, if so let's say if archive is one institution, uh, can we think of gallery as an institution? And what kind of limits and possibilities both um, can gallery as an institution offer to us or limit us in sense? Can these works or works in future have a different afterlife uh, or an alternate afterlife beyond the institution of the gallery? Thank you. Um, I'm thinking of, um, I think I first responded a little bit to what uh, Fernando said. Um, at the start, when we began working with this project, uh, I think Dale had uh, already prepared the concept note. And in the concept note, he spoke of Goa as this portal, where there was a sense of movement coming in and going out, um, the sense of fluidity. And I think this was really the starting point of this project. Um, so to center the entire um, the entire um, discourse or discussion or investigation from this center where Goa becomes um, the, centr the, the central site. Um, but also keeping in mind, and this is what I often hear amongst historians or architectural historians who keep, um, who, who, who keep saying that, that Goa still tends to be a footnote and um, its position uh, still tends to be marginal or peripheral. So I think the, 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 the centering or bringing back to the center was for me the starting point of this, of this project. And the second point is about archives that um, when, we, when we think of archives or what Derrida says about the archive, if he's really talking about the archive and not just memories or both, he talks about the archive as being static or dormant. And I wanted to look at it from a point of view of contamination. So looking at it as, uh, again, the sense of movement where um, it, is, it is continuously shifting. And um, to bring back what um, uh, Uriel had mentioned of Sahidia Hartman, she refers to the archive as as continuously speaking and, and changing. Um, and I think for this, I mean, this, this element for me was, was important. So I think what we were trying to, at least from my perspective, what, what I was interested in looking at was how do we recover or how do we give life to these ghosts from these archives? And what do, they, what do these archives tell us about our own histories or our own stories? And how do we make sense of it in the present situation? And how do we um, how do we make sense of this material? I think that's so. Thank you so much for your comments and readings because 
when we publish a book is the first thing we want is someone to read it and to feel something about it. Um, it was very interesting, both of your comments, and I will say that one of the things uh, uh, from the very beginning, I think, was very structural, uh, structural to our research and uh, all the proposals was the, this idea of recovering voices. And uh, I think one way to engage with the archive, archive as an institution and not uh, as a collection or only a collection, but more than that, a power, an institution of power, um, was to take away, or I don't know, maybe liberate, I don't know if it's uh, too much, <laughs> too much say, to say this, but to take away these voices from the, those archives and gave them a, a history of itself and starting to, with the, their own names. And as Uriel was saying before, it doesn't have to be a person. It can be, could be also the mangoes, no, and the names of the mangoes. Uh, but to give these characters, these agents, um, one voice and one narrative. And I think it was the like a trend in all the, the works, in all the exhibition, was this idea of not talking from the institution, but from the agents that work. And also discussing the idea of what is a colonial archive and how can we deal with it. So regarding also what you were saying, also, um, and the idea also of perf this performance of the archive, it's because we were uh, reenacting, we were um, performing uh, how the archive was built, the writing of the archive, the language of the archive, and going deep into it. So not, for instance, in the colonial archive, not using all, only Portuguese in this case, but trying to recuperate uh, the other languages, or um, specifically the names and also the, the places, the position, each agent. And this idea of talking about the, those more silence in the documents. And I, in my case, I study a very powerful institution and a very uniformizing institution as the Inquisition, as you know. Um, it was a challenge to see and to, in a way, elevate the agency of this age. This, because, of course, they were marginalized, but they were not without agents. And for us, it was very important that all the works discuss this, this question of agency. And I, I think it's also a performance because it's still performing in a way that we are still, like in my representation of a Kipu, people are still making knots. We are still, and Nishan, for instance, is making ghosts or... <laughs> we are still performing this on uh, One of the discussion points I also uh, wanted to uh, have here is uh, uh, the recording of uh, queerness in an archive. Uh, its uh, queer stories were re rarely uh, recorded in an archive. I just wanted to know your thoughts on how does then a contemporary scholar uh, go back into the archive uh, and then uh, look for these stories and fill the gaps where uh, stories of queerness, of marginality have been excluded and then begin to form new narratives uh, from a contemporary point of view. I don't know if there's a formula to engage, um, but what I came across well, studying precisely this kind of repressive archives regarding diversity, queerness, uh, witchcraft, I don't know, a lot of heterodox, uh, heterodoxy, uh, which was considered to be uh, beyond the norm. 
I think a way now we want, we want to engage these stories is precisely what I was saying before, is trying to recuperate in a formal document, an institutional document with a very bureaucratic language, trying to recuperate the voice of those who were under scrutiny. So instead of talking about what the repressive institution said or done, trying to understand what, what those characters were doing in their own time. So we are, for instance, in my piece, I wrote about the, this character of Tituba, the, the witch of Salem. And for me, the novel by Marie Condé is very important because the title, I, Tituba, is a way to break um, the repression of and the normatization of the archive because she recuperated the, the ego, not I. So I am telling my own story. And I think some of my friends that are doing uh, queer studies right now are precisely doing this kind of shift and talking about those agents uh, and not the repression. Uh, um, sorry, I want to add also, um, uh, in Sahil Naik's interview, he's not present today, but he uh, talks about uh, the story of his relationship with the Kurdi village, uh, which is a village in Goa that has uh, undergone this, this traumatic experience and violence of displacement because of this dam that was built. And he talks about how he started engaging with that community and um, he discovered that um, when, they, when they moved from that village, uh, there were no more songs that they had created following their displacement. And so together with this community, they um, created a series of songs, this album together. And that was a way for him to, while he had created and, and negotiated these relationships with them, then they themselves, they realized that there was no more music that they were creating. And so this was one example that I felt was quite, um, was, was quite personal that he brought into, the, into his interview. Yeah, something in relation to what Susanna was saying, uh, a question that I had where I did not put in the response was, um, there's this very famous scholar of literature called Carolyn Levine, who has written this book uh, where she talks about affordances. So each form of expression affords you to do something and doesn't. And she looks at novels and uh, stuff. I mean, just to extrapolate that affordance as a category, um, what does artwork or visual art afford to do with the archives that like, let's say the historian doesn't? And I was just wondering if you could uh, walk us through some discussions that you guys had that, you know, okay, this is not a historian sort of looking at the archive, but this is an art, a visual artist looking at the material and trying to create something. Uh, in some of the works, we can see that, but I was just wondering as a curatorial sort of insight what you guys had in mind when these discussions were going on. I think the most important uh, point of discussion was uh, the deepness of engagement, as <laughs> Nilima was saying to me before, is to say, we understood clearly that this was other thing than an historic, historical work, and we want that precisely. But we still wanted to be very deep, as, in, uh, a, as an historian will do when addressing or engaging with some documents and try to understand the complexity of relations and we are talking about colonial relations etc so a very complex narrative for instance before we are, were talking about Nadia's work and it we the one of the discussions we had was about precisely colonial power and the complexity of agents in a colonial relationship so I will stretch this uh, Thing, this idea of the importance of deepness in each one. And I think they engaged in it. And it was not uh, easy sometimes, you know, because when you have a simplistic narrative, it's easy <laughs> because you have good or bad, you have a unidirectional narrative. 
and here you have a lot of loose ends and a lot of trends and that was the, the, our idea. Um, so I think um, we were looking at um, why something was happening at a particular moment in time. So what is the context of this narrative and how is it possible to transcend this context? I think that's really where we started from. And as Susanna said, yes, it was extremely tedious, uh, the discussions uh, that we had. So we, we structured our, um, our study over, over 12 months, where each month we would have these um, sort of round table online chats and um, with, where we had these readings beforehand. And the readings were not necessarily related to the manuscripts, but they were related to everything from miniature painting to decolonization and that sort of thing. Or uh, certain subjects that artists like maybe Keg were interested in exploring further or Nishant or whoever else or stories related to the Cochinelle dye and, and trade routes. And mm, so at our discussions, uh, I think each of us uh, went through these processes of, uh, of like frustration, confusion, ambivalence. Um, you know, how do we navigate this material? Uh, how do we make sense of it? How do we... Um, how do we uh, transcend it, and how do we how do we um, how do we create these? How do we create a relationship with the missing pieces? How do we um, how do we fill the gaps in a way that it's not it's you know we're we're not making this bold statement, but in a very soft, gentle way. And I think each of the projects does it in a um, in. Yeah, in a very, very subtle, uh, with, with, with the subtle languages and questions that each of, each of them is bringing to the, to the project. Yeah. Um, Maybe one or two questions. We have uh, any questions from the audience? Yes. Shinmos? Uh. Hi, I'm Roshan. Uh, thank you so much for this discussion and for organizing. I think a lot of events that have been able to give us uh, a viewpoint of how people thought about these things and how these things came about. Uh, I, I don't know if I have definitive questions, but I did read a bit of the book already. So, and I did want to sort of point out a few things uh, for whoever hasn't read it. I just wanted to read out a few lines that sort of stayed with me, or lines that sort of bothered me, or lines that, you know, generally we should all, I think, think about. Uh, I think there are a few ones, uh, but I'm sad that Dale isn't here because it was mostly from Dale's piece, and I think is kind of an engagement with Dale, but I, I just put it out for anyone to answer it. Uh, the few of the quotes are, it is now a commonplace and right to think of the archive suspiciously as a mixed condition of fever and dust, studiously to be avoided or at least subverted. That's the first line. They archive, therefore they are, that's the other one. In other words, Indian modern art scene lacked an institutional space in art or an archive, that's the other one. Uh, and then progressive politics too demands archives. Marginalized and minoritized communities can be represented if, there are, if they are entered into some technologies and logics of documentation. This was particularly troubling, <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to, because it's a discussion, I thought we could sort of stay with these, uh, you know, uh, sentence, sentences, phrasing, uh, and also just think about, I mean, for instance, how Foucault or Derrida uh, talk about uh, the power in the archives and how uh, you know, these archives, like you said already, they are dormant, but, and they also represent the institutions which, you know, they are part of. And I think I've written down a few thoughts, sorry. <laughs> so I'm just going to sort of, you know, uh, read that out if that's okay. Uh, I don't really do well spontaneously. Uh, but I was thinking about how, 
uh, these sentences or certain impulses in in sort of you know the book may oversimplify the relationship between archives and power right because archives are embedded in sort of past structures and while entering marginalized communities into archives can provide a representation it can also reinforce existing power dynamics and subject these communities to surveillance and control i think which is also very important to think about and you know it also i think assumes a lot of things especially assumes there's the, the of archival access you know uh, of sort of entering these marginalized communities into technologies and logics of documentation particularly i think i don't think that's particularly beneficial because not all communities and i think keg and i were talking about this not all communities may want to be documented or want to be or may want to be documented in a way that's sort of i don't know debated and thought about or theorized by historians they may already have alternative ways of documenting themselves right and certain progressive politics i think over the years if we look at sort of queer politics queer studies that have come up uh, black brown studies from across the world i think uh, there's a lot of progressive movements uh, movements who are prioritizing on oral histories decentralized knowledge sharing or other forms of documentation so you know what is really this documentation that we are sort of talking about and while sort of we are thinking about representation a lot i think it does not address the importance of participation in the archival methods or archives in itself so is representation more important than participation and how does sort of all of that come about and uh, so i i think just to probably also add these two questions i think i really like what uriel was saying about archive or archival as this broader practice and a broader way of looking at things and i think that's really important because if we are inherently assuming that there is institutionalization which comes with an archive then i may not agree with that but is that really needed for us to sort of legitimize an archive legitimize knowledge sharing legitimize knowledge production right and so what are the implications of viewing archives as practices rather than institutions for the future of archival theory for historians like yourself so working on these projects and you know uh, susanna since you're the historian here and dean is in present i just thought i'd also ask you you know what do you think over this year that you've worked on this project like what do you think historiography or historical theory uh, sort of can learn from this engagement that you have had with artists which who brings sort of a different impulse to history altogether right and i think to suna paranta generally uh, what do you think were the pitfall or gaps in this sort of uh you know whole show and what are your ways of assessing it in what ways will you engage with it uh how will you sort of document that and respond to that i i'd be also interested to know that so sorry i just went on and on but that's pretty much what i wanted to say thank you uh, as you imagine i cannot answer and engage all of, but it's very good because of course the book uh was um a contribution also based on an initial uh point no so maybe you were criticizing in very well some we are criticizing something and you are, we are being traditional in or conservative in a certain way and you are right because our starting point was this traditional one and we are in a also in a pathway no I don't think this book is um a final step. And to me your comments and your thoughts are a symbol of this what I'm saying. Now we can um as an historian as I say I can tell you that this was a very rich experience to me. For for starters because uh, we have to we needed to find a common ground between the old group and that not was not evident from the beginning because we don't want that the artists start became performing historians and historians be performing artists uh, but how can we communicate with each other 
And what happened to me was uh, the questions that they raised uh, obliged me in a good way to go to the documents and make new questions. And when, and you saw one of my talks here, so in that talk I, about New Christian Women in Goa, I was using some of the questions that were raised by our group. So you saw, you <laughs> in a very practical way, how this works, this uh, contribution between artists and historians. I'm not afraid of the uh, creativity and liberty of the artists as an historian. Thank you. Let's continue talking. I don't know, as I was saying, it's not the final step. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Hi, Wednesday. So one thing I'd like to understand, how, it, how is it do you understand what is the archive? Because for me, there is a, it's similar but it's different. There's a difference between history, memory, and the archive. There's a very clear difference between the museum, the gallery, and the archive. Okay, in terms of even structures of power. The structures of power may be similar between history, museums, museumization, preservation. Again, when we look at the idea of preservation or revivalism, again, there are structures of power that enforce this. And then with preservation, revivalism, you also have Sanskritization that happens. Mm. Okay, in today's political context. So again, for me, when we use these words interchangeably, they create problems. And for me, I think we need to separate and like we said, like Spivak earlier, with love, deconstruct and pull each strand out separately to understand what they mean. Otherwise, it just becomes one complicated mess. So coming back to the archive, my question is, what is it that gets archived? Is it a record? And a record of what? Is it an event? And then invariably, we are only talking about state archives or institutional archives. Events are embodied archives within people, within communities. And again, it is then systems of inclusion and exclusion that raise the question of marginalization. And then again, it's about access to who, who gets to read. And therefore, archives exist. It just may not exist for you and me. And then it's our privilege that demands that access to it. And again, I, within when you look at this entire process of looking at archives or things like that, or making art from archives, where does that impulse come from? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I agree and sort of disagree with the first part of your question. Um, we were not using terms randomly. Uh, what we were, we departed from a very traditional idea of archive. What we tried to do was, can we appropriate this term and gave it a new, uh, or not a new, but a, a, diff, a more flexible or a more performative, as to say, uh, signification that was. So I don't see it as a mess between memories and archives, etc. I think we were all of us were very um, understand very well the difference between the different things, but we just wanted to create a, a, a proposal that's not to be a law, but just a suggestion uh, to use archive and to create archive, archives, in a way. And we weren't, of course, here in, in our talk, maybe we talk uh, too much about institu institutions or uh, institutional archives, but some of the artists were creating or using different kinds of archives and, and not archives um, closed in a building or in an institution. So I, I think that in the end, the exhibition, but also the book and specifically the interviews, because one of the common threads of the interviews was precisely ask each of us, what's an archive to you? 
So I think it's you find there um, some thoughts, some material to think about uh, the importance or not. And maybe at the end, your answer could be, I don't think archive is a good uh, term or a good um, way to engage this, this question. I don't know. We, we were not giving a definitive answer. We want to put on the table a lot of possibilities. Archive as a possibility, more than archive as an institution. I will say that. Thank you. Um, to add to what Susanna is saying and taking from her idea of the kipu, which is one of the, the sort of the f backbones or frames of the show, um, I think what we were trying to do is, so we depart from, from a certain point and then um, through our, in, like our circling together, our gatherings and the sharing of ideas and uh, knowledges or questions or uh, confrontations that we were having with each other, I think we um, sort of let loose in a way. We didn't um, want to stick to the rigidities of these terminologies. And so what are the sort of meta archives that are coming into this circle? And I think uh, what we were trying to work with was a kind of porosity, so not something that was rigid um, and, and something that was, that was a bit loose and, and something that could be fluid and something that could be moving uh, and changing with time. And I think you can see that with each of the projects, whether it is um, uh, Nishant who, who talks about how we are archives and we embody archives and or Uriels who talks about uh, the materiality in the, the archive as material or Keg who is talking about it from the point of view of recovery uh, of um, uh, from her investigations of migration plants where plants are the principal actors in those stories um, yeah, I can go on with uh, Onkar's um, fossilization process and his study of pigments that he starts from the cochinelle dye. So in that way, we, yeah, I think it, it would be wrong of us to stay limited and sort of forcing ourselves to be bound by these, you know, these meanings of what the archive is. So, uh, it wouldn't allow us to experiment the way we, we, we did and, and allow these multiple voices and stories to enter them. All right, if there are no questions, uh, thank you all for being so patient with us over these last three hours. And um, have a wonderful evening. Please do visit the show if you haven't already. And. Um, uh, for those students who are present, we have certificates for you from Fundasau and uh, Sunapran. So please, uh, my colleague Justina will hand that over to you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you to Dr. Paolo Gomez again for everything. And uh, thank you to all our artists. And um, yeah, I, I think from, from us, it's, it's just the beginning of something that will yeah, then take. Thank you.